Good evening. I'm Mike Perry, Executive Director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation. We are the Friends Group for the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. The U.S. Army Heritage Education Center is a component of the U.S. Army War College and one of the key facilities within the U.S. Army uh, History Program. Tonight, we're pleased to host Colonel Retired John House. John received his commission as a second lieutenant in the field artillery in 1975 from Auburn University after graduating with a Bachelor of Science uh, in Business degree. He served in command and staff positions in the United States, Germany, South Korea, and Southwest Asia during both Desert Shield and Desert Storm. He retired in 2001 after, after 26 years in uniform as a colonel. Since retirement from the Army, he has worked as a consultant and Army civilian employee and taught public administration and homeland security part-time for several universities. He has earned his PhD in business with a major in public administration in 2005. He is the author of three books, Why War, Why an Army, Wolf Hounds and Polar Bears, the American Expeditionary Force in Siberia, 1918 to 1920, which is the topic for tonight's talk, and Raiders War. He's also published a chapter in Homeland Security textbooks and has written over 300 periodic articles, opinion columns, and news articles. In 2019, working with his wife, Marilyn, he completed a book entitled Home is Where the Movers, Movers Leave You, which really describes a Army spouse's life. He has also co-authored a U.S. Army Center of Military History pamphlet titled The Russian Expeditions 1917 to 1920. He currently continues to serve as an elected representative to the Consolidated Government Council in Columbus, Georgia. Colonel House, the floor is now yours. So Mike, could you change slides? World War One, of course, is still going on in 1918, but just you know, before we get to 1918, now, and I don't want to go into the whole revolution in Russia because I, I don't claim to be an expert on all that occurred, uh, but there is a revolution. There's a, pro a provisional government. There's still conflict uh, between the provisional government and the Bolsheviks. Uh, the, the, the provisional government does not do well trying to run the army. I mean, Russia is just frankly a mess. And eventually, Russia basically walks out of World War I. But fighting is still occurring all over the Eastern Front. Um, and of course, the Russian Civil War starts. And so the Bolsheviks and the, the non-communists or white Russians are fighting. And the Allies are trying to decide what to do because the Allies want Russia back in the war. Uh, they're concerned about Germany shifting troops from the Western Front I'm sorry, from the Eastern Front to the Western Front. Um, and of course, that's a race to build up numbers now, and, and we're starting to get into the war. Um, and, and there are American and European business interests and loans to the imperial government that the Bolsheviks said they would not honor, but the provisional government said that it would. And so clearly it was in our interest for the provisional government or the non-communists to win out in the revolution. Yet nobody really wanted to get involved, involved in a civil war. And then you had this outfit called the Czechoslovakian Legion. Uh, they were actually deserters from the Austro-Hungarian army, about 40,000 in number, that were fighting on the Eastern Front. So they were allied with the Allies, even though they had been you know, part of our enemies. And, and they were waiting for instructions on what to do. Um, and the signals were mixed, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And of course, we entered the war because of unrestricted submarine warfare being declared the second time in February 1917, and then the Zimmerman telegram being intercept and being intercepted where Germany wanted Mexico to attack the United States. So all that's going on in the background, um, and then we get to, to where we are with this intervention idea. Next slide. Uh, you can see Siberia is a big place. It's about 4,400 miles from Vladivostok over on the far east all the way to Moscow. The United States is only about 2,500 miles wide. And that's kind of an eye-opener when you think about it. I mean, Siberia would swallow the United States. Um, and so this intervention that I'm going to talk about occurs in Siberia. Uh, but there's a huge area uh, to deal with, and most of the terrain is very difficult to traverse, especially in the wintertime. Um, and the only year-round uh, transportation asset that you can use is, is the railroad. Uh, uh, roads are few and far between, 
and not very good to begin with. Next slide. There are a lot of reasons that different uh, people or groups uh, you know, uh, proposed for the Allies to intervene. One is to protect the Russian people. Uh, and, and at that point, there was a struggle to win the people to one side or the other. Uh, Allied loans, I mentioned that earlier. I mean, to us alone, the, the, uh, the imperial government owed us $302 million. Saving the Czechoslovakian Legion was an issue. Um, and there, the argument went back and forth. Do we evacuate them and bring them uh, to Western Europe? Uh, or do we have them stay and reestablish the Eastern Front? The guidance was conflicting throughout this as to what to happen. And then, of course, protecting the Trans-Siberian uh, Railroad, which feeds back into that first bullet, protecting the Russian people. The Trans-Siberian Railroad is the only all-weather transportation means in Siberia. Uh, so the railroad is a humanitarian and a military resource. And then there were mixed signals on defeating the Bolsheviks. Uh, many of our allies wanted to attack the Bolsheviks. They feared communism. Uh, we... I would say it's pretty safe to say uh, most, most American senior leaders didn't like the Bolsheviks, but we really didn't want to get in that fight. The State Department, though, wanted, wanted us, wanted the War Department, uh, to order any of our forces to go attack the Bolsheviks because the State Department at the time, the senior leaders were very anti-Bolshevik. Uh, but in, in the end, that's, that's not what the word was to the guys in Siberia. And, of course, President Wilson wanted to be a good ally. Uh, but, you know, the Allies went back and forth and argued over what to do and how much force to actually send. Next slide. Now, I've never been able to pronounce this right, but this, this memo actually summarized uh, what the U.S. forces going into Siberia was supposed to do. Uh, and the Allies, as I said, argued for and against the intervention. President Wilson ultimately decided to intervene. Major General Williams, William S. Graves is ordered to meet the Secretary of War, Newton Baker, in Kansas City. Um, and they wound up meeting at the railroad station on August the 6th, 1918. One of the comments that Secretary Baker made uh, to General Graves was that he would be walking on eggs loaded with dynamite. Because he knew, he knew about the, the disagreement within our own government and then with our allies over exactly what we were supposed to do. And, and I would say the U.S. government never synchronized the State Department and the War Department's ideas on, on what U.S. soldiers were supposed to do. Next slide. Now, a little bit about Major General Graves, the commander. Uh, he was born in 1865 in Texas, a U.S. Military Academy graduate in 1889. He served in the Philippines during the Spanish-American War left the Philippines in 1902. He'd been promised division command in France. He's at Camp Fremont, California, commanding the 8th Division. And I would say, you know, well-known, well-liked within the War Department, um, all-around good guy. His son was Major Sidney Carroll Graves, born in 1893, also a U.S. Military Academy graduate in 1915. He served in the AES Siberia, and he had received a Distinguished Service Cross for actions in France, and then later would receive one in Siberia. So another good officer, but the son of uh, the commander of the forces in Siberia. Next slide. Now the AES hyphen Siberia, the main force was two infantry regiments, the 27th Infantry out of the Philippines and the 31st Infantry also out of the Philippines. And from what I've read about their history, and though I was not an instrument and never served in either regiment, the stories I read said that the 27th was called the Wolfhounds because supposedly after they served, or while they were serving in Siberia, a young soldier outran a Russian Wolfhound that was trying to eat him. And the 31st Infantry took the name Polar Bears because it was so cold. Anyway, both regiments were only about half strength when they moved from the Philippines to Siberia. And, of course, they're going into Siberia initially in their tropical uniforms. Selected people from the 8th Division out of Camp Fremont and from the War Department in Washington were sent over to fill out the two regiments and also provide a medical staff, 
veterinarians because they've got mules and horses, uh, signal staff, map making, intelligence, and engineers. The, the total was about 8,500. That number would go up and down as people, uh, as replacements were brought in, soldiers left because enlistments ran out and so forth. At times, it got up a little over 9,000. But the, the general average was about 8,500 uh, soldiers. Not really a cohesive force in the sense that it was not a division or a core from which all of the assets were pulled. I mean, the 27th Regiment and the 31st were standard Army infantry regiments. But even then, almost half their number were replacements when they got to Siberia. So everybody had to get to know each other on the ground and when they're going into a, an unclear environment um, and potentially getting shot at. And they had a mix of humanitarian support, nation building, counterinsurgency, and counterterrorism missions that they had to perform. And, and that really wasn't spelled out very well. Um, and again, as I mentioned, our allies were sometimes our enemies once we got on the ground. Next slide. Major weapons, generally the same as on the Western Front, except since we don't have a division, there's no divisional or higher U.S. supporting weapons, like there's no field artillery. The M1903 was the, the main rifle soldiers carried, the M1911 pistol. They did have their Browning automatic rifle, um, and they had machine guns, and they had that infantry 37 millimeter cannon, typically pulled by a mule. Next slide. This is an old map to just give you an idea of what the Trans-Siberian Railroad looked like in 1897. On your far right, as you look at this, is Vladivostok um, and, and the, the eastern end, if you will, of the railroad. And then on the far left-hand side, you see it goes up toward Moscow. So it's a long way. And I want to point out right in the middle of the map, you see this big section of blue, Lake Baikal. Um, it's this monstrous lake, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but it has some, uh, causes some really interesting challenges for the railroad. Um, and it's just a huge feature in the middle of Siberia. The railroad initially ran through Manchuria, uh, but a secondary route was built around Manchuria. So there are actually two ways to get through that, that far eastern part of Siberia. Next slide. Trains, as I mentioned, since the trains were the only all-weather means of transportation, the trains are the lifeline for everybody, whether you're a civilian or, um, or somebody in serving in either one of the militaries that are going. And consequently, the trains wind up being armored. And I found this fascinating because actually soldiers would take cannons, mount them on flat cars. They actually eventually took some cannons off some small ships and put them on flat cars. Machine guns were mounted in box cars and on other open cars. And so the trains were almost like ships in themselves, traveling on the rails, shooting at each other, depending on who owned the train. And of course, shooting at whoever's uh, opposing them that's not on a train, you know, infantry on, in the snow or wherever else. But besides trains being a, a combat system, uh, they had a recreational train cars. The Red Cross was there, the YMCA was there, the Knights of Columbus were there. And so all of these humanitarian support organizations set up railroad cars where they could support the troops, um, our troops and our allies. Um, and then, of course, pass to passenger and soldier transportation. So all this is going on over the same rail lines with trains run by different organizations. Uh, it has a huge effect on logistics and of course the escape or movement of the Czech Legion and everyone else. And that RRSC is the Russian Railway Service Corps. And I'll talk about them in a few minutes. Next slide. Allies, and you can see this photograph of, of a train with uh, soldiers on top of it. Uh, about 60,000 Japanese soldiers would eventually deploy into Siberia, around 500 British, around 12,000 Poles. Uh, they were over kind of with the Czech Legion on the Eastern Front side, around 4,000 Canadians, some French. I never did see a number on how many Chinese, but there were Chinese soldiers there, generally allied with us, around 2,000 uh, Italians, and then the white Russian forces, uh, Cossacks being the major combat element in Siberia, 
and two leaders, Semenov and Kamikov, will come up later, uh, that were basically warlords. And then the Czech Legion, roughly 40,000 uh, soldiers. But some of them had married and were bringing along wives and children as well. Uh, but they had generally at least cleared at one point, they basically owned the rail line, uh, at least in places, uh, by August the 6th, 1918. And that becomes an issue in a few minutes too. Next slide. Czech Legion, tough guys, been fighting for a long time. And when they had to be, when it was time to get out, they could be pretty ruthless. Um, in fact, at the end, uh, when they're actually trying to fight their way out, uh, they put the Poles at their rear as, as their rear guard. So not many Polish soldiers made it out. But they did eventually get out. Their goal was to eventually leave Russia, Siberia, um, and come back to Europe and help establish the Czechoslovakian nation. So in that sense, they were successful. Uh, the gentleman on your left was a, a senior general, uh, winding up as the head guy of the Czech Legion. Um, and on the right, are, as an example of uh, some of the Czech Legion marching in the snow. Next slide. Challenges. You know, numbers are challenging to come up with. Uh, Bolsheviks, about 300,000. The terrain flat in places, but also mountainous in places. Not many roads. This big lake I mentioned is 400 miles long and 56 miles wide. And of course, frozen tundra. I mean, I, I read in one place that soldiers never had to worry about refrigerating food because they could dig down 10 or 15 feet any time of the year and hit ice. Uh, the weather, as I mentioned earlier, the troops are typically based in the tropics. We sent them to a cold environment. Uh, the temperature would range anywhere from minus 48 to 104. Uh, the, the cold weather equipment arrived after the deployment, but before they got into the heavy winter. So nobody suffered too much because of coming out of the, out of the Philippines, but still a risk. And besides the non-communists or typically called white Russians and the Bolsheviks or red Russians, there were other Russian partisan groups that were not red or white, sometimes called greens in, in the literature. Well, but there were other partisan groups out there fighting as well. So in this uh, complex environment, you've got multiple allied nations, us, of course, the Czech Legion, that's an allied organization. You've got the white Russians, mostly Cossacks, supported a lot by the Japanese. And then you've got the Bolsheviks and then these green Russian partisan groups. And they're all at one time or another fighting each other. And our mission is somewhat unclear because we were sent over to provide this humanitarian support and protect American interests, not directly to fight. And so that's what General Graves attempted to do. Next slide. Now, I mentioned earlier the Russian Railway Service Corps, or RRSE, commanded by, and I put the colonel in quotation marks because he was not an army colonel, but he kind of anointed himself as one and wore an army colonel uniform, uh, a man named George Emerson, and he was supported by a civilian, Mr. John Stevens. The RRSC was originally recruited to go to Europe. So it was not the RRSC. They were railroad men, typically out of Michigan, that thought they were going to go to France and help run U.S. railroads in France. I'm sorry for Minnesota, not Michigan. Um, they, they adopted a uniform so they looked uh, like Americans. And most of the non-governmental organizations did adopt a uniform that was very similar to what the Army wore which was very confusing to everybody because if it was hard to tell a soldier apart from a Russian Railway Service Corps employee, um, and also um, hard to tell them apart sometimes from people that work for the Red Cross because they sometimes wear army style uniforms. The members of the RRSC thought they were actually in the army because they were had originally volunteered to go to France. Uh, what they discovered upon the end of, of the intervention, when they got back home and applied for veteran benefits, uh, the War Department declared that they were contractors, not members of the Army. Apparently, the U.S. government was sending money to a white Russian government that was then paying the RRSC. So the War Department considered them civilian contractors, regardless of the uniform that they wore. And it wasn't until 1973 when some of the few surviving members of the RRSC sued the federal government 
that a federal judge declared them to be veterans. Next slide. I think I meant there were about 300 members of the RRSC in the theater. And I didn't mention also their job was to help the Russians run the railroads. So you saw how long the Trans-Siberian Railroad is. They're scattered in two and three man groups at railway stations from Vladivostok all the way up to the south of Moscow. And so they are truly on their own. Non-governmental organizations, the Red Cross is there. The American Library Association has shipped over books for soldiers to read. The Knights of Columbus are there. The YMCA and YWCA are there. And they're all there to provide morale, welfare, and recreation activities. And as I mentioned before, the uniforms, though, caused a lot of confusion because it was hard to tell sometimes who was actually in the Army and who was in some other organization. Next slide. Of course, there are U.S. and Allied ships in Vladivostok. Uh, some of those ships uh, uh, demounted cannons, if you will, so that the various allies could put them on trains. Uh, the ships also provided naval gunfire support, and occasionally landing parties would, would go ashore in an amphibious-style type operation in, in you know, boats uh, to attack a target or uh, try to safeguard some particular um, a, a mine or some area um, over in uh, eastern Siberia. Next slide. The initial landing, uh, the Marines and Navy are there first because they're in those ships sitting in the, in the harbor on the 1st of March, and uh, Marines actually landed June the 29th, 1918. Uh, because they were there to try to maintain order as the Russian government has dissolved. And if you read about it, it's really kind of a Wild West atmosphere because the Czech Legion has actually already got some elements in Vladivostok. All of our allies have somebody there. There are Bolsheviks there. There are white Russians there. It's just kind of a crazy place. So Marines go in to protect U.S. interests, uh, but they just basically are you know, kind of like a police force, if you will, in Vladivostok. The 27th Infantry arrives on August the 15th and 16th, and as soon as they get on the ground, General Graves is not there. The regimental commander doesn't really know what he's supposed to do. The senior Japanese general walked up to him and said that the Japanese general was in charge of all of the Allies. He wanted to attack the Bolsheviks. So the regimental commander said, okay. Um, and on the 24th of August, we joined in with the Japanese to attack the Bolsheviks north of Vladivostok. As it turned out, we were moving in support of the Japanese forces that were doing most of the fighting, and the Bolsheviks were routed with really not a whole lot of effort. Uh, but still, we were on the ground and potentially in a combat situation, and we really weren't supposed to be. The 31st Infantry arrived on August the 21st, 21st and immediately went into a garrison situation. General Graves shows up on September the 2nd. Um, he refuses to attack the Bolsheviks. He tells the Japanese, that he's not subservient to them. He doesn't work for them. Um, he shows them his instructions. Everyone does agree to have joint Allied patrols in Vladivostok to enforce order, uh, but there's no unity of command or unity of effort, if you will, among the various Allied forces over what to do. Next slide. Major operations, the 27th Infantry winds up guarding the railroad. They take over this POW camp that's just a real mess. And then there are negative interactions with Cossacks at both locations. You can see a photograph of a train with some 27th Infantry soldiers outside it. Uh, soldiers are traveling in everything from boxcars to passenger cars, depending on what's available. Um, and trains are the key because that's the only way really to get around year round in any kind of weather. Next slide. The POW camp had about 2,000 Austro-Hungarian prisoners, about, well, you can see over 1,500 of them are officers, but there's no bathhouse, there's little food. E Company shows up and takes over, gets rid of the four Russian colonels that say they're in charge, and immediately set up a bathhouse, a laundry, a barber, uh, set up water and electricity, open repair shops. I mean, the, they got the prisoners squared away and organized, and eventually uh, some Cossacks mutinied over their treatment by their uh, their general, um, and they went and asked to be made POWs at this camp. 
because conditions were so good in the camp compared to life everywhere else in Siberia. So uh, we, with typical professionalism and a can-do attitude, E Company of the 27th squared away things in that prisoner of war camp and really set their standard for uh, how Americans would, would carry out operations in Siberia um, and really helped establish a good reputation for the United States with the Russian people and in anybody else that was there as far as how they were going to be treated if we were going to take care of them. Next slide. Guarding the railroad, that reputation for fair treatment of prisoners spread uh, throughout Siberia. In fact, some of the POWs offered to fight for the United States. Um, and guarding the railroad resulted in Russian people asking us to stop ja Japanese and Cossack atrocities. When you read the, the records, um, it's, it's really awful when you read about the things that were done, the way the Cossacks treated regular people and the Japanese as well, and the Japanese forces supporting the Cossacks are just on their own. I mean, torture was common, um, and certainly they both, both groups would uh, brutalize civilians or Bolshevik fighters or, or anyone that didn't do what they wanted them to do. Uh, the Japanese put out a lot of anti-American propaganda, which was a constant problem. Uh, the 27th did confiscate a lot of Bolshevik money. Money became a big issue because you've got imperial banknotes floating around. The Bolsheviks began to print money. The Japanese printed money. Um, and so what money was good for what was a constant challenge. Eventually, the 27th moves out to the center of Siberia around the Lake Baikal area. Um, and as the railroad duties got divided up amongst the different forces, um, even though there was no uni unity of command, everyone understood the need to guard the railroad. And so a, a railroad board was set up um, and it was possible for all of the senior members of the various allied forces there to agree based on how many people they had in, um, in country, who would guard what sections of the railroad. But it was still difficult to really synchronize operations. We could cooperate sometimes, but not really synchronize what we were doing because we weren't all trying to do the same thing. Next slide. The 31st Infantry went in to guard the mines where the coal was mined, and they also guarded the railroad. The coal mines were just a little bit to the northeast of Vladivostok, in a place called Suchon. Next slide. Coal production, of course, was critical for the railroads and, of course, for heat. Uh, the white Russians had attempted to draft civilians. That caused a big disruption with the miners because we needed to keep the miners there to get the coal out. Bolsheviks, of course, used that as a propaganda means to disrupt operations because they wanted to show that the white Russians were not friends of the people and that we weren't friends of them because we were uh, indirectly helping the white Russians because of the mines. There was an attempt to assassinate the mine supervisor that almost killed a senior American that was on site as well. Uh, but the Chinese helped guard the mines and then moved out to help guard the railroad as well. Um, and Americans were in several towns to, to patrol, several towns to patrol the railroad. And for a while, operations were fairly quiet. Next slide. I mentioned atrocities. Uh, the royal family was executed July the 16th before we actually landed in Siberia. Cossacks routinely tortured prisoners and civilians. Uh, really anything you could imagine they did based on what the records in the AES Siberia say. The harsh treatment gradually turned the people toward the Bolsheviks because the Cossacks are allied with the white Russians. Treatment of, of their own soldiers caused some of the Cossacks to desert and try to come to us. Um, and American protests did not stop the atrocities. We would interfere when we could, uh, but just saying we wanted it to stop didn't make it stop. And the Japanese appeared to cover for the Cossacks whenever they could. And I think ultimately the Jap Japan wanted to dominate Siberia because uh, they stayed eventually a lot longer than we stayed. Again, that gets back to the Allies, no one having the same goals when we went in country. Next slide. 27th Infantry guarded over 500 uh, miles of railroads. Um, this one small town you, uh, you see there, Bolsheviks sold the telephones out of the rail station. And then somewhere between 100 and 200 Bolsheviks attacked an American platoon, uh, Lieutenant Rich, who shows up periodically. He was a very active young man when you read the records, put his guys in a shallow trench and waited until the uh, Bolsheviks got close and opened up with mass rifle fire and a BAR. One American was killed, 11 Bolsheviks were killed. And that's, 
that's just kind of typical of the small unit actions. We typically would have a platoon or a company out someplace and they would wind up in some type of action against about a company's worth of Bolsheviks or partisans uh, that were attacking. And it's hard to tell from the records, in some cases with certainty, um, who the attackers were because they were generally assumed to be Bolsheviks and so typically that's what the reports say. But I would say as confused as the situation was, sometimes it's kind of difficult to tell who was who. Um, and also we did have some uh, soldiers desert and join the Bolsheviks and come back and fight us. General Graves, in fact, assumed that some of the deserters were ethnic Russians who had joined the army and volunteered to go to Siberia so they could get back home. And that was a, a periodic problem uh, throughout the time we were there. Next slide. Um, this, it, again, accounts another action um, an attempt to uh, capture one of those deserters resulted in the Cossacks and Japanese capturing two Americans that were trying to coordinate the action. One escaped and got to American lines with Chinese help. And then 158 Americans assaulted the town with a train engineered by a Russian American said nicknamed Casey Jones. The Cossacks and Japanese surrendered. And this again points out the bizarre situation because our the Cossacks and Japanese are our allies yet they captured two Americans and we had to attack them to get well, the one American that was still there out. Another incident, the Cossacks tried to steal 45,000 rifles that were going to the white Russian leader in Siberia and Admiral Kolchak. Uh, the American in charge of the rifles, a Lieutenant Ryan, refused to transfer them and he basically just uh, defended his train against the Cossacks and forced the Cossacks to back down. We later learned after delivering the rifles to Kolchak, he gave them uh, to the Cossacks. So the Cossacks eventually got them, though the deal had been we'd give them to Admiral Kolchak so we could use them how he saw fit with the white Russian forces. Next slide. The 31st Infantry had to continue to patrol and in some cases attack uh, Bolshevik groups around the mines and around the railroad. Uh, the worst battle that happened was at Romanovka, where 300 Bolsheviks attacked an American platoon. A Lieutenant Butler that had just arrived had his lower jaw basically shot off and tied it back on his head with a handkerchief uh, so he could continue to fight and give orders and smoke a cigarette. Um, a white Russian nurse wound up, that was a girlfriend of a sergeant, you know, running through the gunfire to, to give first aid. Um, a Corporal Heinzman went for help and managed to bring back relief. We had 19 killed in action and 25 wounded in action, 25 of the wounded would later die of wounds. We killed 12 Bolsheviks and soldiers recognized five of those from the village where soldiers had uh, bought supplies that same day. Next slide. Uh, throughout the rest of the time, the 31st would continue patrolling. Uh, they also did joint combined operations along the coast because they were on the far eastern side of Siberia. The mine guard operation stopped in August of 1919, so we'd been there about a year. And we continued to reinforce the detachments scattered along the railroad to protect the passenger chain, uh, trains that had to run a gauntlet of small attacks throughout this entire time while we were in Siberia. And eventually, desertions from the white Russian units resulted in white Russian officers asking you, the United States to guard Russian families in Vladivostok because they really didn't trust anybody else to protect them. Next slide. Um, as operations went along, as the Civil War continued to, to, to move forward, the Bolsheviks began to win. Uh, once they began to defeat the white Russians, they wound up attacking U.S. forces because they're again, the allies are controlling the railroad. Um, and the railroad is the only all-weather means of transportation, so the Bolsheviks want the railroad. That again so gets back to the armored trains. Because when you read the stories, I mean, literally, you've got trains with cannons shooting at each other, you know, trying to clear off the track. And the Czechs, even though they've got some forces in Vladivostok, they're scattered almost all the way to, to, to south of Moscow on the railroad when it's finally apparent they've got to fight their way out. And so they start fighting across the railroad and have to, have to clear the path as they try to come out. The RRSC, of course, is trying to get out at the same time. And so picture yourself, you're an American um, and you're 
you know, 4,000 miles from Vladivostok, and now suddenly you see things start to fall apart, you've got to catch the last train out of town that's headed to the east, and that's what they're doing. Uh, the Allies are intermixed with the Czechs. The Czechs are often in charge because uh, they've got more firepower than anybody else along the railroad. And they're constantly fighting and making deals with whoever's in their way. The AEF Siberia withdraws toward Vladivostok. Our units withdraw intact. Unfortunately, civilians, sometimes with the NGOs, depending on where they are, when everything began to fall apart, had to catch rides on trains as best they could. Because uh, there were a few roads in the fall or, or the wintertime that you could actually drive across. Next slide. The 27th Infantry began to withdraw in February and was basically gone by March the 10th, the 31st, February the 15th to March the 1st. The AEF headquarters left April the 1st, 1920. There were still a few members of the AEF left behind uh, to negotiate with the Bolsheviks for prisoners uh, to get them all out. Uh, the Japanese would remain until 1922 before they left. Next slide. Uh, casualties and the level of combat, especially compared to the Western Front, was low. Uh, there weren't you know, that many killed in action. There were some, 27 killed in action, eight died of wounds, non-battle deaths, 135. So total about 170 wounded, 52, but 50 deserted. Next slide. Of course, results, Russia eventually becomes communist. Americans forget about it. Uh, my wife and I are docents at the National Infantry Museum, which is on the edge of Fort Benning and Columbus here. And uh, there is a display in the World War I gallery about Siberia. And I can't tell you the number of times I've stopped somebody and pointed at it and asked them if they knew that we served in Siberia at the end of World War I. And I think in the 10 years the museum's been open, I think I have found two people that had heard about it. So they had some idea we were, had been in Siberia, but didn't know anything about it. But when Khrushchev visited in 1959, in one of his speeches, he mentioned it. The soldiers were pretty much forgotten. At least uh, they were afraid they were. Their families were afraid they were. Uh, one, one congresswoman it has been reported to have said she thought the soldiers were too diseased to be allowed back in the country. Uh, she never put in any kind of bill to actually leave them there. But she was reported to have said we should buy land and just let them you know, leave the army and stay in Siberia. And as I mentioned earlier, the Russian Railway Service Corps members did not become veterans until 1973. And of course, some of our allies became our enemies. Uh, the Japanese are supposed to be our allies in Siberia, sort of are. Um, don't blatantly fight us too much, but then you get to World War II, of course, and they are our enemies. Uh, General Graves, who had been, uh, he, he was moving pretty fast, up until his going to Siberia, and that basically wrecked his career. He had so many bad interactions with State Department representatives, they apparently uh, told uh, other members of the U.S. government that Graves was a communist because he was followed uh, uh, around as he you know, went to various veterans meetings and so forth. They were spied on. Uh, Graves wound up retiring in 1928 died in 1940 and is buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Major Graves resigned in 1920, died in 1974, and he's buried at the U.S. Military Academy Cemetery. Next slide. Here's another one. That's it. Okay. Is that it? Yeah, I think that's it. Um, so, I mean, to me, I find it a fascinating story because so many people don't know much about it. Um, and uh, I think it's important to know um, because we did serve there. We had soldiers there. They did overall serve well. They did what they were told to do. Uh, just that sometimes it wasn't real clear what they were supposed to do. Are you willing to open up now to questions? Sure. Right now we don't have it, but I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, do you touched the infantry soldiers, but the 27th Infantry and the 31st, how uh, have you seen, do those regiments remind their soldiers of their legacy of service? Uh, yes, I'd say so. In fact, um, out here at the Infantry Museum, for example, there's a big monument from the 31st Infantry 
uh, then, then there's a polar bear on top of it. Uh, so I think they, they definitely uh, still, still are aware of that. Um, in fact, a former colonel of the regiment is a retired three-star here, and he certainly knows about it because he and I have talked about it. Um, so I, I, I think that's happened, and the 27th is known as the Wolfhounds. Um, I, think, I think many of the soldiers, or at least some of the people that pay attention to the regimental history, know that they served in Siberia. I, mean, I don't know how much they push it. Uh, the most obvious example here is the 31st because of that polar bear that's sitting on top of their monument out, out here at the Infantry Museum. Uh, this question comes from James, and he's asking, uh, how did Khrushchev regard the American intervention? Oh, he didn't like it at all, because he accused us of killing Russian soldiers. And, of course, we did. I mean, Russian soldiers were killing us, or Russian, you know, Bolshevik partisans were killing us. So he was not happy about it. Um, and the one thing I didn't talk about in the presentation, let me just mention, when I said the polar bears made me think of it, the 339th Infantry Regiment, which I think was Michigan National Guard, went up to Archangel, um, and they, and that's not part of, I, I mentioned it offhand in, in my book, did not talk about it tonight, but all that happened about the same time. They didn't stay as long, but there, uh, we only had a, a, a colonel in charge and a British two-star, and the British hated the, hated the Bolsheviks, and so our guys up there immediately went into combat up in the, up in the woods up in northern Russia. So that's what the, C, the CMH pamphlet Covers both both areas, North Russia and Siberia. Um, so we had we had American soldiers up in North Russia as well, but they were actively fighting Bolsheviks from just about the moment they hit the ground. Uh, this comes question comes from Alicia. I, I might have missed it. Uh, he's uh, this person studied uh, General Eichelberger's life as a yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you talk a little bit about his experiences there? Well, I mean, he went in as kind of the chief of staff for the AEF. Um, he was a major, then a lieutenant colonel. In fact, he was the guy, from what I remember reading, that stayed in Vladivostok when everybody else left to try to get the POWs out, any that were still there. Uh, so, yeah, it was interesting to read about uh, I mean, him being there and, of course, later, uh, you know, his, his time in, in World War II. And another uh, World War II uh, name that pops up, um, if you read about World War II, General Horrocks in the British Army, or in the Army that... Um, commanded 30 Corps in Operation Market Garden, but he's a lieutenant colonel with the British forces in Siberia, out of Hong Kong. Okay. Um, you talked to P, uh, talk POWs, I, I, I mean, how long did it take to get all the Americans out? I think it was just a couple of months. It wasn't all that long, uh, but it was a little bit of time. Uh, but generally, I mean, the Bolsheviks wanted us to get done with us and, and, and we were, of course, trying to get out. So I, 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 I did not read of any particular difficulty other than we, we had to negotiate the release. So I don't, I don't think any of them stayed a long time. Okay. Um, but the atrocities were, were, you said, were on both sides? Uh, yes, uh, they were. But I would say they were probably more by the white Russians than the Bolsheviks, and which is why the people began to support the Bolsheviks more than the white Russians, because I mean, the Cossacks were awful. Uh, when you read about what they did in Siberia, and unfortunately the Japanese helped them, um, it was just, it was awful. <laughs> I mean, it was just terrible. Um, and, and, and so that had, that, that hurt the white Russian, the non-communist effort, because the people in Siberia were, felt safer with the Bolsheviks, even though that, that wasn't great, but it was safer with them than with the white Russians. And that's why the, 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 the green units or the, the, the other partisans began to be formed because uh, people in villages that didn't want to be with the Bolsheviks and sure didn't want to work with the Cossacks would, would you know, develop their own militias, if you will, to try to protect themselves, which is why you have really three different bodies of, of combatants out there fighting in this civil war, though mostly it's the Bolsheviks and the white Russia, the Cossacks in Siberia. You, you talk about this... Uh, there's one railway unit that came, I think, out of Michigan or Minnesota. Minnesota. Uh, this, this question goes, were these folks given any cold weather preparation or cold weather training before they wound up in, uh, in, in northern Russia? Well, they, they, uh, not, that I, not that I read. Now, they were all from the northern part of the United States, so cold weather didn't frighten them. Uh, but they, they had to buy their own uniforms. I mean, so they, they supplied themselves. Uh, they actually 
they went to Nagasaki, Japan, stayed there for um, a couple of months, and then then actually went into went into Siberia. So, and they were typically, I mean, they're not out marching in the snow. They're they're manning a railroad station someplace. What is exciting about them is that they're in small groups, two or three men, um, and they're in these railroad stations trying to help these Russians. Of course, they didn't speak Russian. All of them didn't. And they're just scattered all across the, the Trans-Siberian Railroad trying to make it happen. Um, and and I, I did not read of any casualties with them. But there may have been some, but nothing popped out in any of the reports that I saw. But then when everything starts falling apart, they are literally catching the last train out of town trying to get to Vladivostok and get away. What about the soldiers? Did they get any special training or equipment? They got special equipment once they got in Siberia. Okay. What type of stuff did they get? I get the typical cold weather gear the Army had is a heavy overcoat, uh, heavy heavy insulated boots, you know, an insulated cap, you know, kind of like the, the field caps that we had. Uh, so they got the equipment once they got there. And thankfully, they, did. they went in in the summertime, and so it wasn't cold when they got there, and the supplies arrived before um, before winter set in. Okay. Um, you talked about some marrying Russians. Did, was there any, how, how big of, in, not an issue, but how, how many did you find in records where that indicated that they married a Russian woman? I didn't see a specific number, but it was enough that it seemed to cause concern for General Graves. Now, the, the real guy, the guys that married the most Russian women apparently were the Czech Legion, because uh, of what I read about them, I mean, there were a lot of wives and children in the trains with the Czech Legion moving to Vladivostok. Okay, good. Uh, well, th that's that's the, it for questions. I want to thank you for tonight. Any closing comments? Well, I just encourage people to, you know, to, to, to read about things like this, because I, I think it's important for us to understand where we've had soldiers serve and the challenges that they face, because uh, there's probably a lot we could have learned about counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, from what we had to do back then and humanitarian support, but we ignored it because nobody wanted to think about it anymore because it wasn't part of the main uh, the main operation in World War One. So most people forgot about it. I mean, I didn't have a clue we were there until you know I was told to go research it for my master's degree. Um, so I think it's just important for us to remember you know the things that we've had soldiers go do. Um, and just try to learn from it as best we can and not forget those lessons. Okay. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I want to thank everyone who attended. Uh, and uh, I hope that you continue to monitor our websites and our email blasts uh, for future lectures that will be coming up. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you maybe in about two, three weeks when I think the next lecture is scheduled. But thanks, uh, Colonel House, for coming on board. Uh, thank you for Mrs. House for... Uh, for uh, uh, well, she had to help type the first version. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, is your book still for sale? Um, it is. I think you can still get it off Amazon, and the University of Alabama Press has it. You can buy it direct from them. That's who published it. Okay. And you can buy it in hardback or paper. I recommend the paper. It's cheaper. Okay. You know. <laughs> but uh, it is out there. You should still be able to get it. Okay, well, someday I get to see you if I get down to the Fort Benning Museum, which I should, since uh, I am a, uh, a graduate of the Benning School for Boys. Well, it's a great museum. I encourage people everywhere to come see it. Okay, well, thank you much, and look forward to seeing you. Good night. Bye-bye.